Well, take your Bibles, and as we have been doing for several months now, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you've looked ahead, you know that there are only 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians, and so we are nearing the end of our study of the chaos in Corinth. And as we do that this morning, as we look at chapter 15, and we're going to return to chapter 15 next week, as we look at it this morning, though, I want to ask you a very poignant question. Very poignant question. What if Jesus was still dead? Now, that's an eye-opener. That one, that's one to get you to sit back and take a breath. What if Jesus was still dead? What if, yes, he came down here, was born in a manger in Bethlehem. What if, yes, he lived for 33 years here on earth? What if, yes, he healed the sick? What if, yes, he made the lame to walk? What if, yes, he made the blind to see and the dumb, the mute to speak? What if, yes, he lived a sinless life? And despite that, what if, yes, he was falsely accused, falsely tried, falsely convicted? What if, yes, he did hang on that old rugged cross? And what if, yes... He did look to heaven and said, it is finished, gave up his spirit, and died. And what if, yes, they put him in that tomb, a borrowed tomb? But what if the yeses stopped there? What if despite the fact that Jesus had told his disciples that he would go into the tomb and that he would be there. And on the third day, though, he would come back to life. What if that didn't happen? What if Jesus did not come back to life on the third day or the fourth day or the 44th day? Or four months later or 44 months later? In fact, what if Jesus was still in the tomb? What if you could go to Jerusalem today and you could stand in front of that tomb And that inside would be the bones or the remains of Jesus Christ. It's an eerie silence this morning when we look at the question, what if Jesus was still dead? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is the question. This is the very scenario that the Apostle Paul is using as he is giving instruction to the Corinthian believers. Now he's doing this in an attempt to answer their questions and tell them about the eternal significance of the fact that as he promised, one day God is going to resurrect the dead. They were struggling with this. Now, as you can see in the first verses of the chapter... Resurrection was not something new. The Corinthians weren't receiving this letter and going, Oh yeah, there's the answer. They had already been taught this by Paul. In fact, he evidences this fact. Look at verse 1. He says to them, Now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. See what Paul's saying? I want to remind you of what I told you when I was there as your pastor. Paul was there for quite some time, more than two years. And he and Apollos and Peter, remember we we talked about at the very beginning, the arguments that were about who was telling about the gospel. They had heard the gospel many, many times. The gospel included the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't have the good news of the gospel without all three. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. So they had been taught this before, but Paul, in response to their question, is offering a reminder. Now, a reminder is issued for one of two reasons. 
A reminder is issued so that you won't forget. And a reminder is issued if maybe you have forgotten. Or maybe instead of forgotten, a reminder is issued just to clarify. Maybe the person that needs, to, needs the reminder ha- has gotten things mixed up, has, has gotten things confused. And that's what was going on with the believers in the church in, in Corinth at this time in the first century. They, they, they had become confused. Now whether it was because of the, the Gnostic influence there in, in Corinth. Remember we talked about how wicked a town it was. How pagan a city it was. Gnostic, Gnosticism was the supreme form of false religion back then. It was a belief that, that uh, nothing physical was real. It was all spiritual and so the resurrection couldn't have happened. They, they were inundated with that. They were inundated with pagan worship. They were inundated with immorality. But the saddest part is, maybe they were confused because of that, but maybe they were also confused because of some of the people of the church. And I use the term church loosely. You had the Sadducees in that day and age. And the Sadducees, they claimed to be the religious leaders, part of the religious leadership of the children of Israel, and yet even they didn't believe the truth. The Sadducees did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was, and even though he came, and even though he died, and even though the proof showed that he was risen from the dead, the Sadducees said, no, it was a hoax, there's no resurrection. And these are the things that these Corinthian Christians, these young Corinthian Christians, and even some of the more mature Corinthian Christians were inundated with. No matter what it was, they were confused. And they began to fear. They began to fear the fact that what had happened to those folks who had died, who had gone on. That they weren't going to get to experience Christ when he came. Now remember, Christ coming back again was also being preached. And they were as sure as I am that it was going to be soon. And the Corinthians began to worry about those who had, yes, accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But maybe, or not maybe, had gone on, had died. That they were going to miss out on heaven. We know that not to be true because of the resurrection that we're taught. But in spite of the clear teaching by Paul, in spite of the clear teaching of God's word by the other folks that had taught them, the Corinthian Christians found themselves confused. They found themselves laying claim to false teaching. And that's what we're going to look at today. False teaching. It doesn't have to be outlandish. It doesn't have to wave a red banner that says, this is false teaching. Can I tell you something? If you put one drip of arsenic into a gallon of water, it is no longer pure water. And it is very damaging. God's word only needs to be altered just a bit. And it's false teaching. Anything but the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, according to God's word, is false teaching. And that is what had happened to the Corinthian Christians. Now, before before we do what I always do, look at the children of Israel, whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, and kind of be condescending with them and be like, look, what in the world's wrong with you? You had the apostle Paul as your teacher We, we kind of become a little self-righteous. We kind of become a little pious. Probably because we know the whole story, right? But how many of us would have to admit that we're guilty? I would admit to you that I am guilty of the fact that there have been times when I have laid hold of and I have begun to claim false teaching as truth. You say, say it ain't so. It is so. You see, you're looking at it as something bigger than what it is. And I don't mean that it's not a big thing. I mean, you're looking at false teaching as if if it has to be some outlandish, I've got to be bowing down to Baal for it to be false teaching, for it to be pagan worship. But it's not that way. How many times have we taken, taken God's teachings that are clear, that are concise, that there's no ambiguity to? 
I mean, we're looking at it in God's word. We have it in writing, and yet we still somehow taint it. We still somehow pervert it to make it be what we want it to be, and then we lay claim to it as truth. We do exactly what the Corinthians have done regarding resurrection. Oh, it may not be the resurrection for us. But let's look at two or three things that maybe we do fall prey to. These aren't confusing. There are a lot of things in God's word that are deep, that are sometimes hard to understand. I'm not talking about that this morning. I'm talking about the fact that we as Christians, we take things that, like I said, there's no ambiguity to it. There's no question about what God is saying, and yet we still twist it. Whether it be because we, we, we follow the world, maybe we be because we're taking advice from the world, or maybe it be because we're yielding to our flesh, and all of it is we're, 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 we're opening ourselves to attack from Satan, we do the same exact thing. Let's take a look. Matthew 6, 33. Very simple. But seek ye... What's it say, Pastor Chuck? First. first. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. What's God saying there? Seek me first. Make me priority one. My satisfaction, God says, not yours. Make me first. Make it the priority in your life to live a life that is becoming more and more righteous. I see you, God says, as pure righteous, but until you get to be with me, you need to be striving to be living out how I already see you. And that should be your number one priority. My kingdom should be your number one priority. Is there any way we can get confused about the word first? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And yet... How many times have we fallen prey? How many times have we tainted this truth to make it sound something like this? But seek me first, the kingdom of self and its satisfaction, and all the world has to offer shall be added unto you. And that will be all we need. Sound familiar? That's the teaching of the world. That's the the teaching, that's the nature of the flesh. And that is the plan of the devil. He wants us to take a God-given truth and taint it to make it something that it is not. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will Direct your paths. I'm emphasizing these words because I'm making it clear that the word of God is clear. And yet, times we still, we still taint it to look something like this. Trust in no one but yourself and stand strong on what you believe to be true. In all your ways, acknowledge yourself as the captain of your ship and let no one dictate to you the course of your life. Wow. I yielded to that as truth for a long time. And because I did that, I had to face the loving yet chastening hand of God. Oh, I claimed God's truth. I, I said that, that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 was truth, but really, I claimed the second promise, the promise that I made up, the promise that was of my flesh. John 14, 15. Yeah, I love this one in regards to you, you, you just cannot ever get this one confused. Jesus Christ himself said, If you love me, if you love me, and he's speaking to us as Christians. He's speaking to us, his brothers. He's speaking to us as sisters. He's speaking to us as children of God. He's saying, if you love me, my child, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. How could we possibly 
taint that. But we do. You want to know what we say? We, we, we come back to, to God our Father with this. We say, if you love me, Father, oh, oh God, I, I want to do what you command, but Father, if you love me, okay, you've told me if I love you what I should do, but now let me tell you, if, if you love me, Father, the things you ask me to do, the things you tell me to do, won't ever involve self-sacrifice. Oh, it won't ever involve hardship. It won't ever involve things that I don't like to do. It won't ever involve me taking ridicule. It won't ever involve persecution. It won't ever inconvenience my life. One of the saddest part about that right there is the majority of Christians, the majority of people in churches today, I think, Maybe won't know the reference, but if I said to them, Jesus said, if you love me, you will, the majority of people would be able to say, obey me. But as evidenced as to what is happening in the church, especially in the United States of America, I would dare to say that the majority of people who are able to say, if I love him, I'll keep his commandments, are the very ones who are actually living, living what we said Living a life, not wanting to be asked to do anything that's hard or inconvenient or requires sacrifice. All three of these are examples of exactly what the Corinthians were doing. Be it because they were being influenced by the world, be it because they were being influenced by their, their flesh and nature, they were taking a promise of God and they were kind of twisting it. Putting their spin on it. Let me rescue you, church, as the Lord rescued me this week. Let me give you something from His Word that is a guarantee that that'll never happen. A guarantee that you'll never take the teachings of God and twist it. A guarantee that you can be free from this. John 8, verses 31 and 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in Him. That means He's speaking to us, Christians. Jesus said to the people who believed in Him, You are truly My disciples if you remain faithful to My teachings. Does Jesus ask us to understand all of His teachings? No. But does He ask us to be faithful to them? Absolutely yes. We don't need to understand all of Christ's teachings to be faithful to them. Because where understanding stops, trust and faith start. Jesus goes on. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Is he talking about freedom for eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven? Absolutely. But he's also talking about freedom here on this earth. Freedom from the distraction. Freedom from the deception of the world and the flesh and the false teachings that are out there. Believer, if you're here today and already this morning, you realize why God has brought you here this morning. We have a packed house People here that I haven't seen in quite some time. There are some people here that I've never seen before. But no matter what happened, today was not an accident. You're here because God brought you here. You're here because God wanted you to hear His Word. And this morning you're a believer and you realize that you have been misled by some false teachings. And you've taken them as truth. My prayer is this, that today, before this service is out, even right now as the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, that you will stop That you will ask Him to free you. That you will rededicate yourself to being faithful to His teachings. Now to be faithful to His teachings, you've got to get into His Word and you've got to know His teachings. Some of us, no doubt, fall prey to false teachings because we are not sure of the real teachings. That's not an excuse, but it is a reason. If you're not in God's Word learning about God's teachings, you're easily led astray. Let me tell you something, church. Don't ever come in here on Sunday mornings and take what I say. Look into the Word of God. Test me. Test what I'm saying. I'm not supposed to be getting up here telling you what Rob thinks. I'm supposed to be getting up here telling you what God thinks. That's my job. That's my duty as an instrument of God and a deliverer of his word. Don't just sit out there and say, well, Pastor Rob said it, so it's got to be true. Get in the word. 
We preach from the word. We quote the word. We use the word of God, not of me. Test it and see that it's the word of God. You've got to know God's teachings to be able to live out God's teachings. Saying, well, he tells us. He tells us that we can be shackled. He tells us that we're going to be slavery, in slavery of sin if we're not what? Well, verses 33 and 34 tell us, do not be misled. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Do not be misled, Christians. Bad company corrupts good character. What does that mean? Don't take counsel. Don't take advice in regards to issues of morality, in regards to issues of your faith from someone who is not saved. From someone who is not a believer or from someone who you can look at their life and if they are a believer, they are living in total rebellion and living in total distraction. Don't take advice from them. Because I said so? No, because the Word of God says so. You will be misled. Why? Because they're not going to offer you advice that comes from God's Word. Don't be misled. What does it say? It goes on and says, Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. Come back to your senses. Maybe God brought you here today to hear that verse because you need today to come back to your senses. Paying attention to the conscience and the Holy Spirit that God has given you. Today He is telling you right now the sin that is in your life. The sin that is hindering you. The sin that is causing you to lean on false teachings from, that you have tainted from God's word. And he's saying, enough, my child. Come to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. You can be set free today, Christian. But maybe you're here today and you know right now. So far, we're not speaking to you. Paul's not speaking to you because Paul's speaking to Christians and you realize today that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have never put your full faith and trust in the saving grace and the blood of Jesus Christ who came and paid the price for your sins. And to you, whoever you are, if you're here today, you have laid claim to the greatest, most deceptive, and most destructive false teaching in all of eternity. And that is, there is other ways to God except for Jesus. If you are basing your eternal security on anything but Jesus Christ and a total dependency on Him... if some idea that it's Jesus plus something. Jesus plus good works. Jesus plus giving. Jesus plus church attendance. If you think one day you're going to stand up in front of God Almighty and He's going to put your good on one side and your bad on the other side and one's going to weigh out the other and you're praying and hoping that your good's going to outweigh your bad, let me tell you that if that is your, where your eternal security is, you are on your way to hell. You are on your way to hell. Because let me tell you something, the standard is perfection. And there's no one in here who is perfect. We've all at least sinned one time. And so therefore, if the standard is perfection, and we're weighing good against bad, bad will always be heavier. Thank God it's not about good versus bad. Praise God that we have the ability to stand before God and Him look at us and say, Why? Why should I let you into my kingdom? And praise God, Jesus Christ will be there and will say, Father, you should let this person into your kingdom because he's one of mine. Because he claimed my saving grace given by you in love. Because he listened to my teaching in John 14, 6 that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. If you're here today and the Holy Spirit is just literally tearing at you right now, you should be very thankful. 
Because God is offering you an opportunity. Because God is the author of salvation. Salvation is a God thing. I am simply standing up here giving you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm a messenger. You can listen to the Holy Spirit and you can make the decision today that will change your eternal destiny. Or you can shrug it off and walk out of here headed for hell. The Bible says that God desires that no one, no one should experience that. He proved it by sending Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, down here onto this earth to pay the penalty for our sins. You understand that the penalty for sin must be paid. You don't have a choice about that. The penalty for sin must be paid. You have one choice, and that is this. Either let Jesus pay the penalty, accept his payment, or pay for it on your own. Pay for it on your own. I pray that today, if that is you, that even right now you are calling out to God, claiming the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And I pray in a few minutes when we have that invitation that you'll come forward, not because that saves you, but you'll come forward and if you have any questions or would love to know more from God's word about how you can make that eternal changing decision, that you'll do just that. Well, the choice that many of the Corinthians had already made was to accept Jesus Christ and his saving grace. So now Paul returns and he's trying to help them grab a hold of the truth. He's trying to help them not be confused. And he's going to use the gospel message to do this. In fact, we're getting ready to look at verses 1 through 12. And we're quickly going to see five clear points of the evidence that says Jesus Christ is alive, not dead and because Jesus Christ has been resurrected one day all of those of us whether it be us or the Corinthians all of us who before the return of Jesus Christ die it is appointed unto man once to die save we being here when the rapture happens all of us are going to die God said so as a result of the garden But all of us, praise God, who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and is the firstborn of resurrection. One day we can be assured that we are going to be resurrected. And that's what Paul's trying to get across to the Corinthians. Look at verses uh, 1 through 12. We're going to go through them together. Paul says, now brothers, I want to remind you, pay attention to my emphasis, of the gospel. The gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. You want to know what the first evidence that Christ was resurrected from the dead is? You. Me. Who is you? Who is me? Who was Paul speaking to here? Who? Christians that were members of the church. The body of Christ. The church. The church is evidence that Jesus Christ is alive. Why? Jesus Christ was the founder of the church. Jesus Christ was the author of the church. Jesus Christ is the one that said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, his body. Guess what? If Jesus was still dead, we wouldn't be very effective. But praise God, over the last 2,000 years, the true church of Jesus Christ has continued on and on, doing the job that Christ had for it to do and reaping the results for the glory of God. This is evidence that Jesus Christ is alive. The church. Isn't it awesome to be a part of that? We are the body. And when our arms are moving and reaching and our voice is telling, not only are we doing what God has told us to do, but we are displaying his glory and we are displaying the proof that Jesus is alive. Amen? Look at verse 3. For what I received... And he's talking about the gospel. I passed on to you as of first importance. I cannot go past this. I know it's 11 o'clock, but I cannot go past this. 
You want to know what Paul says the gospel is? Priority one. The gospel is of first importance. And if the gospel was of first importance to the apostle Paul, the gospel is of first importance to Jesus Christ. You want to know what ought to be the first importance of Lighthouse Baptist Church? The gospel. If there is one thing I should get up here and tell you about every single Sunday, it is the gospel of Christ. Why? Because that's what this book is all about. From beginning to end, it all points to Jesus. And if we're not pointing to Jesus, we're playing a silly game and we're pointing to the wrong place. Because if we're not pointing people to Jesus, we're pointing them to hell. We're pointing them to hell. Oh, may we never be a church. No matter how much we grow, no matter how much we do, no matter how many programs we have, no matter what, may we never be a church, ever, that says the gospel is not priority one. Amen? For what I received, the gospel I passed on to you as of first importance. Here we go. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You want to know the second evidence that Jesus Christ is alive? The scriptures. We don't have time to look at these passages, but you can jot them down. Look at them on your own. Psalm 16 verses 8 through 11. Psalms chapter 22, and one of my favorites, Isaiah 53. What are these? These are prophecies. These were prophecies that were given hundreds, if not thousands of years, about the birth, about the life, about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And guess what? They all came true. It is mathematically and statistically impossible for the 700 and some odd Old Testament prophecies to be fulfilled exactly in the New Testament, it is not possible. And you know the answer I have to that? With God, all things are possible because every one of them has come true. And the Scriptures are historically accurate, though they have been attacked for the last 2,000 years. You want to know why the Word of God is and probably forever will be the number one best-selling book in the world? Because it's got the truth in it. The gospel, the scriptures prove themselves. They are the truth. We move into verse 5. And that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, and most of whom are still living. That was at that time though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, this is Paul speaking, as to one abnormally born. Now Paul's not saying that he's weird. Paul was abnormally born, being born again, in that Jesus Christ had already ascended into heaven. But we know that Jesus Christ himself appeared to, at the time, Saul to become Paul on the road to Damascus. And that he specifically looked at Paul and said, Why are you persecuting me? And that was Paul's conversion experience. Paul saw Christ. So what are we looking at as an evidence? His appearances. His appearances. Now, i got to ask you this question. I love history. And I've been doing some studying. I've actually been watching some shows about John Adams, okay? The first vice president of the United States. Do I know John Adams? Have I ever seen John Adams? Have I ever seen Benjamin Franklin? Have I ever seen John Hancock? Have I ever seen George Washington? Have I ever seen any of these men? No. Is there anybody out here that's seen any of them? I mean, I know I'm young. Is there anybody here that can lay claim to that? Then why do we believe they're true? Why? What is history? History is a recorded people writing down and being preserved as to what has happened based originally upon those who did see it. You know where I'm going. Why is it that no one would deny the existence of Washington? No one would deny the existence of Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, John Hancock. We're willing to say, hey, people saw it. It's in the history books. 
And yet, Jesus Christ, after his death, burial, and resurrection, was seen by more than 500 people in the first 40 days. Seen with them, ate with them, laughed with them, allowed his wounds to be touched, ate breakfast on the shore of the Sea of Galilee with them, appeared to them, and yet we want to deny the existence of Jesus Christ. There is more written, historical, accurate evidence that Jesus Christ was who he said he was than some of the other greatest events in history in times past. And yet still, and still, people don't want to believe him. Believe it or not, my Jesus is alive. Amen? Verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, number 9 is very important here, because not only did Jesus Christ make appearances, but the man who wrote this letter was an eyewitness. He says, For I am the least of the apostles. The fourth evidence is the apostle. The apostle Paul saw Jesus Christ. Yes, it was after he went back to heaven. But not only did Paul speak to him, but he saw him on the road to Damascus. And as a result, Paul was blinded for some time afterwards. But by the grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Now, right there, I need to clear up something. I don't want you to think that the Apostle Paul was an um, arrogant man. You can see how he starts that verse off. He says, but by the grace of God, your grace is enough, Lord. Amen? But by the grace of God that we're all where we are. So Paul makes that clear. The only reason he says, no, I worked harder than all of them. All he's talking about is the amount of time the Lord allowed him to work as well as the geographical extent to which Paul went to. None, no other of the apostles were able to do that. Why? Well, because the majority of all of them, except for John, were martyred. Were martyred, were killed for their faith. That's all Paul is saying there. But we move into verse 11. We see the last evidence. Whether then it was I or they, he's talking about the other apostles, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. You want to know what Paul's saying there? He's laying claim to the fifth evidence, and that is the unity of the message. He says, hey, whether then it was I or they, this is what we all preached. The same message, the same gospel, the same truth that Jesus loved us enough to live on this earth, to die, to be buried, and to be risen again on the third day. Our message has not changed. No one has backed down. No one has said, oh, let me show you where the body is. Now let me stop here just for a second. Do you realize, do you realize that Paul was beheaded? Do you realize that there were disciples who were tied to horses and drugged through the streets until they died. Do you realize that there were apostles, disciples, who were shoved off of temple towers and killed? Do you realize there were some boiled in oil? Do you realize that there were some who were beheaded? Do you realize that Peter was hung upside down on a cross? The worst type of execution known to man in that day. Now let me ask you something. And I'm going to tell you what I'd do. If it was a hoax... If Jesus Christ was still alive and somehow they'd pulled off the great switcheroo and put his body somewhere and they were getting ready to put you in boiling oil or they were getting ready to impale you with a metal rod or they were getting ready to shove you off of a tower or they were getting ready to drag you through the streets and the rocks and kill you or they were getting ready to chop off your head or whatever they were going to do, do you not think that you'd be willing to say, I'll show you where the body is? Because I would. If it was all a hoax... then the martyrs throughout the history of time have been idiots. The 
But you want to know why they haven't been idiots? You want to know why those who have been martyred for the cause of Christ are with Jesus, are with God right now to receive that great crown of glory? You want to know why? Because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Paul goes on transitions in verse 12. He says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Uh, Paul is saying, Look, you know that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead as the firstborn. You know that's a part of salvation. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Paul says, how can you not believe that the rest of the dead will be resurrected? We're in big trouble, he says. So now here's what Paul does. Paul's going to play devil's advocate. He's going to play devil's advocate. He's going to say, okay, what if Jesus is still dead? Then what? Okay, let's say you, you, you believe these false teachings, they're truth. There's no resurrection of the dead. What does that mean for us? Well, Paul goes through verses 13 through 19 and he lays out six tragic consequences. Okay, Corinthians, if Jesus is dead, I mean, I've already given you the evidences that he's not, but if he is dead, here's where you find yourself. Look at verse 13. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Number one, if Christ is still dead, I am wasting my time. I should be flying airplanes. I should be driving race cars. I should be doing whatever else I want to do. Why? Because my preaching is useless. Guess what, church? If Christ is still in the grave, your preaching is useless. Wait a second. I ain't a preacher, you say. Fooey. The Word of God says you are. Oh, you, it may not be your earthly vocation. God may not have called you. He may not have, uh, have asked you to come and, and be a pastor or a leader in the church. But no way can you escape the Great Commission. Go ye! Guess who that ye includes? Me. You. Every person that has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But if Jesus Christ is dead, don't waste your time. Because our preaching is useless. He goes on to give number two real quick. Our preaching is useless and so is your faith. So many people want to say that Christianity is a blind faith. Phooey. We don't, we're not asked to have faith. Our faith has an object. You want to know what that object is? Jesus Christ. So guess what? If Jesus Christ is still dead, Paul is saying, our faith is useless. Verse 15. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. You want to know another tragic consequence if Jesus Christ is dead? We're a bunch of liars. I get up here every week and I tell you a big lie. Because if Jesus Christ is dead, then Scripture is a hoax. and We have no hope. And all I'm doing up here on Sunday morning is, is entertaining you or telling you a good story that is not true. 16, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. One of the most tragic, if not the most tragic consequences of the fact, if Jesus is still dead, is that there's no redemption. There has been no redemption. We are unredeemed. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. Period. You see, that's where that verse would end if Jesus was still dead. For it says, but the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If Jesus Christ is still dead, the verse ends right there. For the wages of sin is death. And so therefore, we all still are on our way to death. 
physically and spiritually. We are all on our way to hell if Jesus is still dead. For there is no redemption of our sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are also lost. Paul said, hey, you don't have to worry. You guys were worried about uh, the, the, the folks that have died. You're worried that they're not going to experience the resurrection. Well, if Christ is still dead, you don't have to worry about them, or you need to worry about far more than that because they're lost. And just like I told you, Paul said, they died without redemption. They died in their sins. Paul says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, because if Christ is not alive, there is no hope after death. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, oh, listen to this, we, that's us Christians, are to be pitied more than all men. Skip down to verse 30. Here's, he tells us why we should be pitied more than all men. And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord, if I fought wild beast in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. We are to be pitied, church, if Jesus Christ is still dead. Why? Well, because we're wrestling against our flesh and we're wrestling against the devil and we're trying to live this standard of conduct that the Lord has given us and we're, we're told to deny ourselves and that's what we're doing. We're told to be more like Christ and that's what we're stri striving to do. And though the Christian life shouldn't be all about rules, there are rules and there is a standard of living, there is a code of conduct, there is the matter of self-denial. And if we're living all of that for a man who is dead, how silly are we? Why should we be persecuted as Paul was? Why should we be hunted and, and all the stuff that Paul went through? Why should we do that if Jesus is dead? You want to know what we should be doing? We should be eating. We should be drinking. We should be partying. Why? Because all we have is this life. Doesn't that make you sick? I mean, there are some good times in this life, absolutely. But there's a lot of bad times in this life. Can you imagine if this is it? And Paul says that's the truth. If Jesus is not alive, this is it. So you better enjoy it while you're here because after this is over, it's all bad. We get to verse 20. I can sense Paul's frustration. He's tired of playing devil's advocate. He's entertained the question, what if Jesus was still dead? He has entertained this question long enough. He boldly, I, I believe in his letter, I believe he probably traced over the word several times to make it bold. You know, they didn't have that word option where you highlight it and make it yellow and exclamation points. He would have probably done that if he'd had word. But here's what Paul says. He's told them all the evidence. He's told them all the consequences. And now he comes to this point. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. Amen. Let me try this again. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Amen. amen. If there's anything we should say amen about, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because without it, everything else is futile. Everything else. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what men may say. I see his hand of mercy. Right? I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Amen. To stay up to date on current events at the church, check service times, or if you have questions about the Bible, please visit us at lbchurch.com or call 
740-678-2738. Thanks for listening.